before I get going, I need to mention we have some special visitors with us today. I don't think they're in the sanctuary right here. Phil and Michelle, if you're here, raise your hand because I can't see you. They're not in here right here. But let me tell you, Phil and Michelle Parker are with us today. Uh, they went to Jefferson City Christian Church when they were at Carson Newman. And since that time, we have been honored to partner with them in their missionary work in Thailand. Uh, they've been some primary uh, receivers of support that we give uh, to missions, and they've done some great work in Thailand. They're going to be sharing with some of us today over lunch about what they're doing. They're getting ready to step into a new phase of their ministry. And so as you leave, when you look straight ahead, you're going to be able to see some of the stuff that they've got set up. And probably Phil and Michelle are going to be standing there. Feel free to go and talk to them and encourage them. Uh, they have done some wonderful, wonderful work over the past few years. Uh, and i got to tell you, I'm, I'm getting up here, and I'm a little disheartened because early this morning, about 745, my brother— won the day. He just won the day. The best thing I'm going to hear all day long. I was hoping it would come from my sermon, but no, it came from the lips of my brother at 745 this morning. Uh, we walk in, and we're all kind of coming in, getting lights on and stuff, and um, I, I, he walks in, and he looks pretty good, and I say, hey man, I like those pants. And, and, and he stops, and he looks at me, and all seriousness, <laughs> he says the thing that kind of captured my heart. He said, these pants. Everybody loves me in these pants. <laughs> that was his word. I was like, that's great, man. We should all have a pair of pants that we look at and we say, you know what? Everybody loves me in those pants. Um, so I, I pray that for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and give you a pair of pants <laughs> that you can feel so confident in that everybody loves you in those pants. Um, so everything, it may be downhill from there, um, but we're going to get into this study that we've been doing and out of this little book in the Bible. It's a little letter in the Bible called, uh, called Galatians. Paul writes to some people in an area called Galatians. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and try to find that. Don't worry. You can use the table of contents if you need to, uh, or if you're on the Bible app, you can find our event on uh, the Bible app. While you're doing that, let me just give you a little bit of a recap. I'll go very fast. If you want the full recap, you're not going to get it all right now. If you want the full recap, go to our YouTube channel. It's Jefferson City Christian, and you can watch those and share those, or, or, or if they're awesome, rewatch them. Do whatever you want, uh, but you can you can get caught up uh, to what, what we've done thus far in the study. Uh, so, but let me give you a, a little recap. Paul, writing this letter, is mad. Uh, he's, he's mad because what's happened is uh, he's this great missionary, and he has gone to these regions all around the Mediterranean Sea, and he has, he has taken just the pure gospel, what we call the great message uh, about, about Jesus Christ. He's gone, and he said, hey, listen, God has invited you. He's invited you to be part of his family. He's invited you to be part of this movement, and there are no requirements that you have to meet. Jesus, his son, has met all of those requirements. So you're totally forgiven and you're totally accepted into this big, open, wonderful family. And it's, it's, it's good news. And, and people are responding to this thing. The gospel means it's just good news. Well, what's happening is, the reason he's mad, there are people who are going behind him. And they're saying, hey, that guy you just heard from, uh, he's, he's not bad at all. There, there, there's more to it. There are requirements that you have to meet. This thing called the Jewish law, these festivities, these acts, these things that you have to do to be part of the family. And so Paul's, Paul's mad at two people, really. He's mad at the people who are delivering that message, who are adding to the gospel. But he's also mad at some of the people in Galatia because they're falling for it. And they're doing it. They're going back. And so what we've been doing over the past few weeks is I've been giving you some of these main ideas. It's too much to go verse by verse in. I'm trusting that you will kind of read through it on your own. But I'm giving you some of these big ideas. And Paul, last week, when we talked about chapters 3 and 4, he, he gives sort of the big argument, this idea that, that Jesus has met all of the requirements. Your sins are forgiven. He's given you his spirit. And he starts off the, the, to kind of head toward home in chapters 5 and 6 with this concept now. Because now that you know, now that you know this idea that there are no requirements that you have to meet, you're invited to this family, there's this thing that we've got to deal with. And he starts off talking about it in Galatians chapter 5. Verse 1, so let's pick up right there, okay? Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. He writes, It is for freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. It's for freedom. You don't have any of all these requirements that we've got to meet. You've been saved for freedom. Now, to get our minds wrapped around what he is thinking about as he starts off this section. I, I started thinking about this idea of freedom. And when we come to those points in our life that we're kind of like, okay, the uh, calendar kind of opens up a little bit. Now what? 
Now, now what do I do? And it got me thinking about this thing that, that a lot of people go through called the empty nest syndrome, right? The empty nest. We got some empty nesters in here. We got some people wishing they were empty nesters in here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit. About it. I started thinking about it, and I came across this article in Huffington Post, and it was it was about ideas for empty nesters. And I think that this really, really starts to capture something that I want you all to, to keep in mind as Paul starts his argument. So I want to read some of these ideas to you. Here are the ideas. First idea, follow your kids back to school, right? If you want to, if you want to do some more schooling, some of you are saying, no way, I just got done taking my kid through school. I don't want to do that. I want to see a college application. Um, the, the second thing, plan and dream. You don't have time to think about yourself. So do some planning and some dreaming. Uh, number three, Get reacquainted with your spouse. That's not a bad idea, right? That's good. Hey, stranger. Um, have friends again, right? Become friends with people again. You've, you've lost all touch. Um, go camping. Now, if you look at these things right here, right, let's just stop. If you're a kid and you're looking at these things right here, you're thinking to yourself, I have ruined my parents' life. Right? 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 I mean, my goodness, they're, they're dumb. They didn't get to go to school. Uh, they don't get to dream. They tell me to dream all the time, but they don't get to dream. That I've come between my mom and my dad. I've ruined their marriage. They don't even get friends. They don't even get to go camping. Right? We have, we have ruined their lives. But if you feel bad at all, this should cheer you up. This next thing that you see that is suggested to them to do because you're just going to laugh. I promise you this is on the list. I think the post article, ideas for empty nesters, turn on the music, and dance naked by candlelight. Yeah, I think, I think at that point, somebody, is somebody clapping? Don't clap. Don't clap. Don't, don't do that. I think, I think the article writer just gave up, right? I'm thinking uh, camping, I don't know, dance naked. Let's just, let's just close it out with that. Um, here's the thing. I know it's silly, it's crazy, but, but the, the idea behind that suggestion was this idea that maybe over this time, you've not been taking very good care of your body, get more in touch, take better care of your body. And, and so that's, that's kind of the idea there. But let's look at the idea behind all of these things, because this is, this is a thing that I, I think is going to help us get our minds around what Paul is doing. Whenever we have a little kind of gap in our calendar, or we, or we maybe see our, our responsibilities you know, change a little bit, our default setting is to think, it's me time, right? It's time for me. It's time to do some things that I've been wanting to do. It's time for me to get mine. And, and, and I want you to hear me say that, that all of those things, except for maybe the candlelight thing, are good things, okay? Uh, all of those things are things that maybe you should consider at a certain, a certain time in your life. But here's the issue. When we translate that idea to our spiritual lives, and, and, and we look at this idea that Paul says, hey, hey, Christ died to meet all the requirements. You don't have to meet the requirements. It's for freedom that you have been saved. If our default setting is to then say, okay, well, then it's all about me. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's all about me. We can get ourselves into trouble because here's the deal. Paul has already talked about these wonderful promises, these wonderful things that God has in store for us when we become part of the family of God. And the issue is that if we make it all about us, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss the wonderful life that he has for us. And, and there's a couple of different ways, and Paul is addressing both of these. The first one we've already talked about. There's a couple of different ways that we miss it when we make this gift of God all about us. The first way is legalism, right? This is something we've already talked about. Uh, we, we, we hear that it's a free gift to us, but we're not sure if we can believe that. And so we're like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not so sure. I feel like I still need to earn it. I feel like I still need to do some things uh, to earn God's favor and to be good with him. And so we start coming up ways to make ourselves miserable, right? And we make ourselves miserable and we make the people around us miserable because we tell them they're not doing enough. And it's this idea of legalism. Uh, and again, that's just, that's just us thinking about what we need to do to feel better. It's not about what God has said to us. And we've already kind of addressed legalism, but there's something else. There's another thing that we need to watch out for and the way that we miss it. What's Paul, it's what Paul gets into today. Look further down in Galatians chapter five. Look at verse 13. Galatians five, verse 13. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Now, the flesh is what's originally written there in a different language. Uh, some of your Bibles may say something like uh, the sinful nature. The idea is that when we just think about kind of what we want in our flesh and bones, what, what my stomach wants, I'm hungry, what our mind wants, what our own personal interests are, our passions are, then what generally happens is we choose things that if we indulge in them, we create a lot of pain. 
And so, and so the idea, the reason they say sometimes instead of your Bible, not, instead of flesh, will say the sinful nature or something like that, is it, it just wants to capture that idea. Is that a lot of times we long for things that if we indulge in them, we create a lot of pain. And so, so uh, do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So don't indulge. So the two ways that we miss it, the first one is legalism. Then what I would say the second one is, is this idea of license. We just kind of give ourselves license to do whatever we want to do. Now, here's the way that I think that this really works out, okay? Yeah, I don't think that normally, under, under most circumstances, people don't get saved. People don't accept Jesus. People don't become part of the family of God and be like, thanks God, this is wonderful. Grace is awesome. Now I can go kill people, right? That's not generally where we go with it. We don't say, all right, grace is so good. Now let's go back to that life of debauchery because I've got Jesus. That's generally not what we do, right? What we do is these little allowances. And, and when we say things, we, 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 say, we, have, we have words that we use when we do it. Uh, we let our anger get out of control and we, and we mistreat people and, and we'll say things like, ah, oh, nobody's perfect, right? Nobody's perfect, but, but, but God's got my back. And, and we don't really have any intention of really working on that anger. Um, or, we'll, or we'll do something like, you know, we'll get drunk again. And, 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 we, and we say to ourselves, well, you know, Christ died for sinners, you know, he, he, he loves sinners. Um, and so, you know, I'm good with God, his grace is enough, we're all good. And, 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 and when, we, when we do that, we have no intention of actually working on that issue. It's these little allowances, these little, little things that we, that we think are okay. And I want to show you what happens in that. I'm getting ready to do some hand motions, okay? So you, they're going to be really good, so somebody record this. All right, here's what, here's what, here's what happens when we do that. Think about Think about a human relationship. And if this is like healthy, if this is like we're cruising along and we're doing and we're doing really well, if you think about a human relationship, if you are in this, this process of, oh, oh we, I do something that messes up the relationship out, and then we get back together and we're healthy, and then I do something that messes up the relationship, I say something I shouldn't, and we get back together, and we, and we, and we have this pattern going on in our lives. What you know and I know is this. If you get back together after that and you've got that pattern, you don't get back into healthy, do you? What really happens, what really happens is when you when you do things and you kind of mess things up, when you get back together, you're a little bit lower than hell. You're, you're not quite back all the way. Because you know that they're gonna do it again. And then and then and then what happens is you, you, you hurt each other and then you try to get back and you're a little bit lower than you were the, the last time it happened. And over time, what you do is you trend further and further away from each other to where one day you turn around and you look around, and there's just no hope, right? Right. Well, what Paul is saying is when we do this license thing, when we just kind of allow ourselves to mess up and go back and mess up and go back and never work on it, you're really just on a totally different path. You really are just moving further and further and further away from God. And he's like, that's not that's not what I want for you. And I don't want to give you a new law. I don't want to do that. I want you to have something so much better. So what is it? What is better? What, what, what is it? It's not legalism. And it's not licensed, then, then what is it? I, hear, hear this. It's not compromise. Okay? Compromise is never good when your only options are bad. It's something totally different. And he writes about it and sets the stage for what we want to talk about. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. He writes this. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the spirit, remember, if you're led by the spirit, you're not under law. This is not about a new law. This is about something totally different. Now, now, last week we kind of opened the door to talk about the Holy Spirit. I can't go through that all again. Watch that on YouTube if you want to. Uh, but, but this idea of the Holy Spirit is a huge issue. And Paul wants to start talking about what it means, what the difference is. A life lived indulging to the flesh and a life lived in step with the Spirit. And I love what he does because the next thing that he does in this letter is he, he wants to draw a picture. He, he gives you a couple of lists here. And what I want to do is I want to literally give you a picture, okay? So, so look at this graphic that I've got here. He actually wants to lay the two things side by side and he wants you to see the difference. On the one side is the idea of the flesh, or the sinful nature. Or it is this idea of immorality and impurity and hatred, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, right? And then he talks about the list of what it looks like to be in step with the spirit and it's this idea of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and i love what he says because he says it's obvious and, and when you look at the picture that he paints 
It's obvious, right? Who do you want in your life? What are the kind of people that you want in your life, right? Do you want these people in your life or do you want these people in your life? It's, it's obvious. It's also obvious just when you see it in action, right? Um, my wife and I have had just the wonderful privilege um, to be able to be part of our, our kids' public schooling and, and, and we've been able to get in those schools. And I don't think there's anywhere where it becomes more obvious when you look at, you look at a child and you say, man, um, they're being shaped by some good stuff. They got, they got good things going on in their life. And you can look at another child and through no fault of their own, you can say, man, they're being shaped. Um, they're being shaped by some really painful, difficult stuff. One of them you look at and you're like, man, they're on the way to patience and, and joy and peace and good things in their life. And the other one, man, it's, it's pain. It's destruction. One of them is the one that you want your daughter to bring home, right? And the other one is the one that if your daughter brings him home, you want to make sure and show him your gun collection, right? Uh, you need that. Or you just show him the closed door and you're like, you know, it's back there. You better hope you never find out, kid. You know, because you know, because it is obvious. And Paul paints this picture for us. And we see it. We know it, but here's the thing. It's so interesting what happens. It's so interesting what, what happens when there's a big group of people like this who start to try to do this, who start to try to walk in step with the Spirit. It is so interesting what Paul pivots to, to talk to us about. And I want us to look at it. We need to pay some attention to it. Look at, look at what he writes in Galatians 5, verse 26. He says, let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Paul knows our nature. He knows what we, what we tend to do. You know, we get, a, we get a bunch of us and we, we want to start walking in step with the Spirit. What do we start doing? And we start looking around at other people and they're like, man, I'm not as good as that person. I wish I need to do more. I need to try to measure up to that person. Or we'll look at somebody and say, oh, they're not as holy as me. They're not as faithful as me. We make it into this competitive sort of thing. And I think there's just a couple of things interesting about this. First of all, it's interesting that when Paul wants to start talking to us about how we walk in step with the Spirit, he starts with our relationship with others. That's where he starts. And he also begins with, you better watch yourself. The attitude that you have when you want to start walking in step with the Spirit. So let's talk about that. Let's look at that. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 3. This is where he starts to get into it just a little bit. He writes, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught, caught. Let's stop right there. If someone is caught. Now, when we see that word, what we are tempted to do is we are tempted to see that word caught, and we think of the word busted, right? If someone is busted, if someone, if someone is like, gotcha, right? That's what we tend to see when we see, we see that word caught. But that's not the spirit at all. That's not the word that is even there. The word that is there is this idea of if someone is trapped, if someone is ensnared. Do you see the difference in the perspective? One perspective is more, more sort of competitive. Oh, man, they're busted. And, and we can even be tempted to take a little joy that somebody gets caught in something, knocks them down a few notches. But the other perspective, if someone is ensnared, if they're trapped, it's a perspective of compassion. If we want to be in step with the Spirit, we want to try to do this together, we have to start with a compassionate spirit for each other when we're helping to shape each other. If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should what? Restore that person gently. Restore that person gently. It, here's the thing. So often when we see someone who is, who is trapped, our thought isn't immediately the idea of restoration. We think somebody ought to preach a sermon on this. <laughs> somebody needs to talk about this behavior. Somebody needs to get on to people about this. And you know what that does? That just heaps a little bit of shame and guilt on people. That just kind of calls people out. It doesn't necessarily start them on the path toward restoration. Restoration is deeper than that. It's harder than just us standing up here preaching a sermon. It's more about actually getting involved with someone, getting in a relationship, having a conversation with someone about what they're going through. Restore gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Now, what it's saying right here is it's not you don't get around these people because you might be tempted to do what they're doing. That's not what it's saying. It says watch yourself because if you start a relationship like this where you're trying to help someone be restored, you might think you're God. 
<laughs> you might think that you've got this holy thing about you that makes you so great. And here's the reality. Listen, we all make terrible gods. <laughs> Don't go there. Even the best among us makes a terrible god. And Paul is warring this off and saying, Don't be tempted to think that. And here's how we keep from thinking that carry each other's burdens. If you're going to be willing to call somebody out on something, first of all, have a perspective of compassion. <laughs> But you better be ready to share with them what you're dealing with, too. That's hard. That's hard to have that kind of relationship. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Man, when you look at this thing that Paul starts with, the depth of this relationship, we don't have a lot of these, do we? We struggle to create these. In fact, even in church, it's one of those things that it's kind of hard to get into a relationship like this. One of the things that we're committed to at the church is that we love classes. Classes are great. They are wonderful. In fact, we've got some great classes now, and we've got a whole slate of new stuff going to be happening on Sunday mornings starting in January and Wednesday nights, and, and classes are a good thing, but classes are not the best environment to do this. To really talk to each other and develop this sort of relationship. We are committed also to creating environments where we can just really sit and talk. Um, we're so committed to it that my dad and myself and my brother all lead small groups that meet in homes. Because we think there's just something about meeting in a home where some of those walls are broken down and you can really uh, start to talk. Um, I have a, a group of guys that I get together with every other Wednesday. We meet over at Lisa's Country Kitchen. And we just sit down. We, we read something together. We read some scripture together. And we encourage each other. We're starting to have some really good conversations um, and things are going deeper and, and our hope is I, you know you pray this our hope is that we're starting to do this that Paul talks about because what if the church did this what if we were a community of people who had that kind of relationship helping each other walk in the spirit can you imagine not only what would happen in your life but what would happen in our community there's all kinds of meetings going on right now in, in, in our community about how to make the community better right we need jobs we need tourism we need this we need that and sure all of those things are great but you know what we need you know what would transform things a group of people truly walking in the spirit a group of people walking in a spirit that can not only change a person but can change a marriage and can change a home and it can impact a neighborhood <laughs> This is where it's at. The greatest obstacle that people have for getting involved in church, it's not our supernatural beliefs that we have. It's not. I mean, you talk to someone long enough, you really get into one-on-one -on -one conversation, they can understand why you might believe in God. Um, they can understand why you might think that there was something really, really unique about Jesus. They, they can. They really can. If you really talk to people, they get why you maybe hold some of the beliefs that you have. That's not the greatest obstacle. The greatest obstacle that people have to coming into the faith is the way that we treat each other. And the way that we treat people who don't believe like us. And if we could start to practice this, man, the Spirit can start to really take root. Do some amazing things. So, so your, your, your question, your next question may be, okay, okay, John, so how do I go? How do I go from being the person who's always needing to be restored? Like the guy who's always getting the text that says we need to meet for coffee. You're like, you hate that text, right? Because we're going to meet for coffee. You're going to have to talk to me about something that I've been doing. Right? How do I go from the person who like, needs to be restored to the person who's helping to restore? And, and Paul goes to that. He talks about that, and I want to mention it to you, some of the things that he, that he mentions before we, before we close things out. Galatians chapter 6, look back with me, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. He, he starts to write, he says, do not be deceived. And, and right there, just right off the bat, let me get your attention, because do not be deceived, deceived is his way of going, hey, 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 pay attention right here. <laughs> That's Paul's way of saying, you need to listen to what I'm about to tell you. Do, he says, do not be deceived, because we are really tempted to be deceived on this next point, okay? So he says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh, will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit, will reap eternal life. Here's why he wanted to, like, wake up right there. Here's why he wanted you to listen. And this is, this is hard. This is not easy. Even though we're safe for freedom, that doesn't mean freedom's easy. <laughs> because
because this is true. Whatever is growing in your life, whatever's growing, are, are, are things like love and joy and peace and patience and self-control, are those growing? Or is it more about kind of envy and, and anger, maybe even drunkenness? Are those growing? Whatever is growing in your life, that's what you've been sowing. Whatever you're reaping, that's what you've been sowing. That's a hard truth. We have to come to terms with it. Paul says, if you want to start walking in the Spirit, you've got to start sowing differently. So the bad news is, that's tough. We have to look at our lives critically. The good news is, sowing's not hard. Sowing is not nearly as hard as we make it out to be. Let me talk to you about sowing before we go, okay? There's three things about sowing that this is actually really good news. Sowing needs to be small, it needs to be easy, and it needs to be consistent. When, it, when I say it needs to be small, let's talk about something like reading, reading our Bibles. Man, we make it so much harder uh, than it should be because what happens, here come January, a bunch of you are going to be like, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year, right? And I'm going to get on my Bible reading plan, I'm going to read seven chapters a day, and long about February, everybody's quoting Leviticus, you know, you're like, yeah, you like it says in Leviticus, because you've been reading your Bible reading plan. But here's the thing, it's so demanding, what happens is, by March, you're out. Very, very few people stick with that. That doesn't work for most people. But listen to this, what if you did this? What if you just spent about five minutes, you open up the Bible and you read for about five minutes or something. And in that time, you found like half a verse, okay? Half of, of Psalm 1, 1. Half of that verse is um, the Lord watches over the, the, the paths of the righteous. That's just half a verse. And what if you started thinking about that? And you just thought about that all day long. It took you five minutes to find it. And you realize that no matter what I go through, he's watching. No matter what I step in, <laughs> he's watching. He watches over the righteous. And you're like, well, I'm not righteous. But then you start thinking about this gospel message. And you're like, but... Jesus is righteous, and it's, it's God's gift to me. And you start thinking about this stuff, and you become deeper in the Word. And you, throughout the year, have 365 little nuggets of Scripture that you have let seep into your soul. How much different would it be? Man, the smallest seeds can make the biggest trees. It needs to be easy, okay? It needs to be easy. I know we all love to go on the hike and get on top of the mountain and look over and pray to God. That is awesome. That is wonderful. But if you're waiting, if you're waiting to go on the hike and get on the mountain before you can pray to God and have a moment, then listen, that spiritual life is, is, is going to be a long time coming. It, it's going to be hard to find. We need to make it easy, people. We need, to, we need to have a chair at our house that we go to. And when I sit in that chair, I pray. Make it easy. Have, have, have a book. It sits on your desk. And I get 10 minutes. And I can do a little bit of reading in that book. Something about reading. Some of you don't like to read and you don't think you can read. Here's, here's something true. And, and you can do the math yourself. Uh, I've already done it, so you don't, don't have to. But <laughs> here's the math on reading. If you can read at a fourth grade level, and you read for 10 minutes a day on a fourth grade level, in a year, you've read over a million pages. That's like 20 books. Small and easy, make it accessible to you. And I'm not just talking about things like reading in your personal development. But man, let's make relationships easy. Let's meet for breakfast. Let's get together with some people in our neighborhood. Let's make it accessible so that we can help each other stay in step with the Spirit. Because I promise you this if you make it small, you make it easy, you'll be consistent. The smallest seeds make the biggest trees. As we close, uh, the singers are going to come up here and they're going to do a song. And I love this song because I think it captures the heart of what we've been talking about in this book of Galatians. I love how Paul ends it. He ends it with this little phrase. He says, listen, meeting the requirements of the law and making yourself feel guilty to do a bunch of stuff or not doing a bunch of stuff, that's nothing. That doesn't matter. What matters is, and he uses this term that's so important in his writing, what matters is new creation. What matters is new creation. He doesn't want you to just be a better you. <laughs> he doesn't want you to just be a better version of what everybody else is trying to be. He wants you to be something totally new, totally different through the blessing of his spirit. 
And you know what I think? I think there's a bunch of us maybe feeling a little old. We're feeling a little old in our faith. We're feeling a little beaten down by our faith. That's not what God wants for you. That is not what he wants for you. He wants you thriving with his spirit, leading to joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, self-control. So what I want to say to you is that we sing this song, if you say, you know what, I want that newness, I want to experience that, then listen, you are invited. You are invited to be part of that family. Those sins, you are forgiven. That spirit, it is available to you, and it's all because of Jesus and what he has done. And it's awesome. It's new. It's what you are invited to. You don't have to be the most faithful person all the time, every single day. Because it's not about your faithfulness. It's about his faithfulness and what he's already done for you. The scriptures write that his mercies are new every single morning. How can we say no to that? I encourage you to pray about it. I encourage you to think about it. Come forward if you need to. Let's stand together and let's sing this wonderful song about our Heavenly Father's faithfulness.